Hi everyone and welcome here in Hall 3 today on this rainy afternoon. Uh, we from Berlinale Tenants are very happy to have you all here with us today for the upcoming talk Control-Alt-Delete, Leaving the System. And actually with any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the moderator of this event and head of Berlinale Shorts, Anna Henkel Donnersmark. So enjoy. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Um, who has been to Berlinale Shorts and saw how to disappear in full length? So we have a few, very few people. Okay, so we're all almost on the same page of not having seen it. I mean, I have seen it, of course. <laughs> but, um, so to my left is Kevin B. Lee. And these three gentlemen are total refusal. Michael Stumpf, Robin Klengel, and Leonhard Müller. Welcome. Müllner. There is an N I dropped. Müllner. So um, I would say we watch the two clips first, and then you can introduce yourselves according to the clips. So we start with a clip by Kevin. Hello. I guess it's on. I want, should I offer some introduction of what we just watched? Do you think that would be helpful <laughs> or should we just move on to the next clip? no no first okay. no let's talk about this for a minute but first i would like to hear your thoughts comments what went through your head just now from watching this material and then we go into the context or whatever i can also start okay, I like if this. I like this. Yeah, that's, I, I can start that's a very want. that's a very typical reaction i get when i show this to people <laughs> I can start if you want, because I thought it was interesting that you process the material through your body. Like you said, you were afraid to touch it, and then it would actually, in some kind of way, go through your body. You don't have to comment on this right now, but that's something that struck me just now. Is there something, what went through your head, what did you observe? I mean, I guess uh, this method of, of distancing yourself from the material and also this uh, that um, as a method, which is maybe necessary, but also the, the kind of the importance of how, how strong images can be, this kind of struck me when I first saw it. Um, you make desktop documentaries, but your desktop is this default uh, desert desktop. <laughs> Um, can you say a, a few words about that? Uh, well, if, if you watch the entire 18-minute um, video, uh, it's basically chronolog chronologizing a, a passage of time. Because if you're familiar with this particular desktop, it's one that is uh, temporally dynamic. In other words, it changes over the course of the day. So it, it begins with a, a picture of sunrise, a desert sunrise. And then at the end, it's like the middle of the night. So it's, uh, it's, it's a way of showing the passage of time through the changing of the desktop. Yeah. Hang on, does that mean that you had to do certain scenes at a certain moment in the day because you wanted to have a certain <laughs> background? That is one way to do it. <laughs> ah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. The restrictions of, yeah. you have similar situations with the restrictions from outside. Because a desktop is something very personal. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, trash bin is always filled with something, and um, but you always have to somehow clean it. And, mm. and when, when you present it to the audience, then you have maybe some somewhere your 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 uh, file which is named desktop, <laughs> where all the other files yeah, are in, right, right. and you put them back after you have uh, done your document. There. Yeah, it's like a new form of character depiction or narrative. It's it's exciting. Uh, so I, I should acknowledge uh, and point out that this is actually a collaborative project with uh, Chloe Galabert-Lenné, a French filmmaker and researcher. Uh, she was actually in the talents as a mentor for the uh, short film station, but she left yesterday. Otherwise, uh, it would, there would probably be a better uh, gender balance on stage uh, with, with her uh, presenting the work as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, her desktops are very different from mine because she makes, she makes her uh, investigations and uh, she has different ways of representing her personality through uh, just seeing what's on her desktop. She copied you or the other way around? 
Uh, well, it's actually a series of letters that we exchange with each other. So this is a video letter w in which I uh, investigate the first quote-unquote feature film produced by the Islamic State, Flames of War. Uh, and then she's uh, looking at other examples. Um, one, uh, a video, uh, an ISIS video that actually became the most watched video on uh, French uh, official news media on their YouTube channel, thinking about how, basically, what is connected to these uh, videos and how do they circulate and spread across the web. But if you need someone to clean up your desktop, I can <laughs> recommend Leonhard. Okay. He has this great technique of just putting everything in a new folder called desktop. And then he puts it in uh, a Another folder folder called desktop. desktop. And <laughs> so there's like, so, and then there's desktop new and desktop one. So that's so kind of, that's yeah. perfectly logical. I'm very familiar with it because we work with his computer mainly. Is there something you want to add? No. no. <laughs> well, this issue of, of present, what, what we reveal, what we conceal, what we consider as presentable and not presentable, is very much at the heart of this project. Um, and I don't know if I should be a little too transparent, uh, but this, this project was actually rejected by Berlinella. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm comfortable saying this because it was accepted elsewhere. Um, it will be um, presented at the True False Film Festival in, um, in the US, which is a very fantastic non nonfiction festival, which uh, is um, in, in an installation format, so it's two uh, screen installation, uh, my video letter facing uh, Chloe's video letter uh, playing simultaneously, and then we also have a, a station in which uh, visitors can write their own letters. It is meant to kind of help, it's a collective sense-making project in which uh, we, are, we're tr we're, we are trying to make sense of these videos that are very difficult, um, difficult to watch, difficult to make sense of, and trying to find ways to stage a conversation and exchange with others. Uh, there was another festival that I will not name that also rejected the film, um, but gave me the most incredible rejection letter I ever received. Um, because this, this rejection letter was so long and had so many thoughts, it was just like a, an incredible analysis, uh, expressing the programmer's uh, discomfort um, with the material, but at the same time fascinated with it and trying to find a way to to have, uh, to present it to public, because the previous year there were many objections to, uh, oh, this, this film is offensive to my community, this film is offensive to this community. It was a very, um, there's, it's very hard these days for programmers <laughs> uh, um, to deal with the identity politics and the, the sensitivities. And so she, instead, instead of um, inviting the film, she invited me to have a closed door workshop with a, a film programmer, a film critic, and a filmmaker. Uh, to watch the film and devise a new strategy for how this work could be presented next year. <laughs> so I found this really fascinating of, wow. um, yeah, relating to the theme of leaving the system. Sometimes we do have to leave the system as it's normally functions in order to find a way to, uh, to make the system work better or to, um, for, for works that like these two engage within the quote-unquote system. But so. it's so interesting, so you're, the material you're working with obviously is, is so contagious ideologically that even you are contaminated now as a person and need to be contained. <laughs> Absolutely. And the quarantine. And it's a matter of how do we, how, what, what uh, responsibility and what role can we have in managing our own contagion? I think that's uh, one way to think about it. I, I wish we, uh, I wish I, you know, if that's the best sort of cure, best sort of coping mechanism, I wish there was such a thing for like the coronavirus, but this you know vi viral virality is such a dominant um, theme in our society right now, both uh, literally and um, and thematically. The, the left, it, uh, sorry, the left loves antiseptic spaces, no? Yeah, but like those are the most boring spaces. <laughs> so why would we, you know? Uh, so yeah, I, I, it's how do we deal with um, states of com contamination, states of compromise? Yeah. And I, I think that's related to your work. You're working mm -hmm. within a space that, uh, in some ways, is, um, I guess, compromising, like the, 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 the video game space, what it asks you as a player to do, what, what uh, ideologically you become complicit in just by mm -hmm. playing. Uh, it's, it's something that you don't take for granted. But can I come back to this uh, um, virus contagious uh, thing? So you watch tons of ISIS, Daesh videos. Was there a moment where you were actually fascinated, maybe even addicted, 
but fascinated <laughs> by it, or where you could see this sort of right that the heroism or whatever it is also yeah I mean I guess something in you I mean the, another yeah I guess another way to ask this question is why why did, how did you get involved with ISIS videos in the first place and I <laughs> I um, I'm not totally sure I know the answer to this question but I, I think it had something to do with um, starting with a love of cinema I, I I've been a film critic for many years and um, seeing the ways that cinema, cinephilia, the, the things that we hold so highly in a place like Berlinale gets reappropriated, contaminated, corrupted, because uh, you know, here I'm looking at hat, the, the quote unquote first feature film by ISIS, and uh, they didn't apply to Berlinale, they just put it online, and it actually created this uh, big sensation, um, big media sensation. So how were they using, because, because just to imagine that ISIS had made their own blockbuster really drove the media crazy. And so how does cinema as an idea or as a language get used in this way? Uh, so for me, it's really looking at cinema um, through a lens of terrorist, terrorism and, and the sort of corruption of ideals. Did they send it to Berlinale as well? <laughs> Obviously not. Kevin just said that they didn't. I will double check because we only get up to 30 minutes. I guess that was a feature length film. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, but maybe then we move on to hmm. your um, film, um, How to Disappear. Uh, Berlinale Shorts has started, or we have a blog for a long time, but I asked my programmers if they would write like to write about a few of the films that we screen and also my team, the most beautiful article I think came from our intern. And uh, the Alejo wrote about your film and uh, said, I think he said the, the cheeky child of cinema video games, something like that. <laughs> so we're gonna see something, a, a child of cinema and how you deal with that child of cinema. Can we the next Ausschnitt have, bitte? So Kevin, what went through your mind? Oh yeah, so um, I, I love this because, uh, well for many reasons, but uh, one top of mind was, um, I'm a big fan of uh, Harun Faroqi, the late uh, German media artist and filmmaker, and uh, one of his last works uh, was a four episode of series of videos called Parallel, um, which also what I think was not uh, accepted to Berlinale, so it's a very uh, it's a very nice club to be in. So. Uh, but it's uh, but it's um, yeah, it, it's it, I, and I was very curious if you've seen this work because it's uh, also looking at the the borders, the limits, and the rules of of social uh, governance within the video game environment. Um, yeah, the, especially the one called Parallel Two, where you also see players. Die, spontaneously die if they go beyond where they're supposed to go. Um, so it, yeah, I and and very much this legacy, uh, especially within German um, film and art of of media that criticizes media. Uh, and this is why I'm I'm very happy that we have this particular program. Uh, I don't know if there's a uh, a film critics uh, program within. Uh, the Berlinale Talents talks, but this to me very much functions not just as a, a short film program or a uh, film art program, but a, a critical media program. So maybe my question then would be, um, yeah, how do you see your work as a critical practice, as a creative practice, as a activism practice? You know, it's, it's, it's nice that you can kind of push all these buttons uh, at once, but how, how do they uh, formulate in your minds? Um, well, yeah, I guess there's a, a couple of answers to that. I mean, our collective deals with intervening in the public spaces of games, and our approach is that we, we never, up to now, never modify games. We don't just work with game aesthetics, but we only work with, within the limit of the game. We, we log into the game as any other player would do, so we have the same possibilities to, to manipulate the game as any other player. So, and as soon as you as you log into a game, games nowadays are designed in a way that 
there is really very little time or very little space for reflection. They're, they're, they're designed in a very slick way so that you instantly know without even having to ask yourself the question, what am I supposed to do with, this, with this, these tools that are provided to me? Or so, so you're instantly kind of driven toward one task. And, and when you're in that mindset, it, it like, it, it, at, at first it, it's, there's really no space for, 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 for critique in that, in that sense, that you're completely like, oriented towards one task that you're doing in the minute you get into the game. So in a way, yes, there is a, there's this, that would be one of the answers, that this critical approach of taking a step back and, and kind of like looking at the, the borders that these tools that the game provides you um, establishes and transgressing those borders. But of course, when it comes to, uh, the, to the question of critique, um, this is one of our uh, main interests. I mean, we are indeed fascinated by, by, this, by this media also. I mean, we work mainly with these blockbuster video games. Um, and they are, I mean, of course, you can see this is, this is crazy what they, how, how these worlds look like and what you can do there. Also, this, uh, the experience is, is, is uh, very strong. I mean, I myself is like sitting there playing this game because I have, had to play it for, for uh, sweating and screaming and it really touches, touches me like, like nothing else in the sense. And, um, but at the same time, of course, I mean, most of the storytelling and the narrati narrative possibilities that this medium could offer are not used, so um, and there's there's and and I think this is really something where we can relate our um, work to Faroki as well. Is kind of to that we always try to kind of see the underlying like the layers of ideology that uh, that are being somehow processed uh, in 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 these games, um, and yeah, it's especially interesting because the, these worlds, they offer you as a player this possibility to be free and to do everything. You can go wherever you want. And this is one of the key like things that the big games want to evoke in you as a player is that give you this feel feeling of freedom. Mm. So to, you're free, you're a Western hero. You can take your horse and you can ride, uh, ride it till the, the end of the world and to the desert and you can go to everything, whatever you like. But in fact, of course, this is a very framed experience in another sense because there's always this, the code and the code decides the rules of the game and how this is meant to be played. So, I mean, of course, as, as far as you try to do something that you're not supposed to do, actually, you will really easily come to a border where this is there you reach something that is actually not possible and where um, you're actually not as free as it, as, as it makes you believe you are. So kind of finding, fighting with these borders and trying to kind of find, find them even and to reveal them, um, that's exactly, that's, that's what we're interested in. And in both the video game and the ISIS videos you analyzed or looked at are recruiting tools. They both try to tell a story of war that is one that makes war attractive. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me. Um, of course, there was American Army, this game on, in the year of 2000 to 2001, when US uh, American Army uh, was commissioning uh, a game uh, in order to recruit, uh, recruit uh, uh, young um, people, which was very surprising that something like this happens in a Western democracy at this time. Um, but all the other, um, most of the other uh, uh, games dealing with war, these triple A, these blockbuster games, are avoiding politics or, or uh, avoiding um, to 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 call their product pol uh, political. It's it's like they're they're always putting so much effort into into being into providing just just entertainment. Mm. There is so much energy put into this kind of anti-political propaganda, you can say. <laughs> and and this, is, this is, of course, what, what we see completely in a different way. We are opposing this because all of these medias are uh, political uh, works. I mean, we have to do with, we deal with, with this kind of money cake uh, um, image they're producing, this bad and good. Who is good and who is bad? And how is the bad guy uh, depicted. This is a question which really fascinates us, and 
and why uh, why you can, for example, loot. Uh, uh, like like grab a lot of stuff in someone else's house, mm. but you have to kill um, loot, uh, looters or uh, plunderer, yeah, yeah. Looters. yeah. yeah. Uh, others who do the same. But you're the good one. Like there are hundreds of questions, and mm. um, I mean we are dealing here with games who depict national socialism, for example, and um, this and 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 it's. They, they, they attempt to, to make this battlefield neutral. Mm. And there we are, there where we are stepping into. Because we are, we are homo politicos, I think. We are very political. Um, our, our media, guerrilla, is a pseudo-Marxist collective. Mm. So we are trying to make this game software being kind of our pseudo-Marxist propaganda and bringing it back to the community as well as to this uh, elitist audience of film festivals. And, and, and there's, there's some context to that because in contrast to the film industry, there's really this discussion going on since, well, the last couple, over the last couple of years uh, with especially developers, game developers, reinforcing this point that they don't they want to kind kind of keep playing and, and politics apart that, that their games are not political yet of course you have these contents of like police brutality playing soldiers and so on and they they kind of all come from this false assumption that the status quo is never political it only becomes politics once you transgress it and so you can basically um, yeah you, you can you can for example, um, display police brutality without being political in the game, apparently. And, and of course, that's, that's, I guess, when it comes to like, seeing this as a form of critique, that's one of our key motivations as well, this kind of meta co the debate that's going on in the game scene. So it, taking this game as an example, it's really interesting because it really tries to make Second World War completely apolitical, which is a crazy thing if you think <laughs> of this. And so, it's so basically, humorous, yeah. yeah, you cannot decide on which side you will fight. You're just uh, randomly allocated to one of the two sides, the Allies or the, or the Nazis. Uh, and you also, if you don't really um, and pay attention to it, you don't actually see much of a difference. It doesn't really say you, like, you no, know, there's not like big emblems or something like this. I mean, you have flags and so on, but it's really, it really keeps this totally in the background, which you can really forget if you're now American soldier or German, doesn't really matter. Um, and, and at the same time, what was actually like really discussed in the game, in the game community like crazy was the fact that in this game, they have introduced uh, the possibility that you play as a woman. So a woman soldier, and, and, and many people were woman really... Woman Nazi soldier. Woman, woman Nazi soldier. So people got really crazy because this is, you know, this is against history. And, <laughs> uh, and, and that did actually not happen. That there were no Nazi woman soldiers there. And, and like this kind of... It, it can't <laughs> be seen as a progressive gesture. And, and yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it was also seen as this. But many people then complained, uh, I don't want to be uh, uh, faced with this, uh, with a political agenda because I don't want to be forced to play woman. No one is forced. You can choose to play as a man but people saw this really as a as a, as, as a, and there were people boycotting this game because of of uh, historical uh, um In inaccuracies. Yeah, inaccuracies yes which is so but what about the isis videos how political or apolitical are they well i i'm just thinking about the question of ideology related to video games how they relate to isis videos uh because the thing is one, one thing i want to make clear is my 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 target the more i investigated isis videos the more i realized that my my object is is actually going through isis videos into some larger realm of media production ideology and the role of propaganda and fascism within a larger space of just everyday media production. What do I mean by this? So when I was um, looking at this ISIS feature film to understand how it was being made, there were some really strange transitions and special effects they were using that I'd never seen before. I was like, how do they do this? So then I just started um, Google, searching on YouTube, trying to come up with the right words to describe these effects. And the next thing I know, I'm like binge watching hours of YouTube instructional videos, and it's all by these young, cis, white, cis males, hey guys, VFX bro, here, <laughs> to tell you about how to make your super awesome explosions, and like realistic as ever. 
And uh, yeah, there's just so many of these. And it's a cottage industry. There's some of them who've become like influencers and are able to make a living just telling people how to make their explosions and, and really uh, awful uh, graphic uh, scenes of violence as realistic or as entertaining as possible. And then and I connect that to what you're investigating here. How, uh, how, how does um, these things that we should take critically and be questioning suddenly get packaged as a form of empowerment, as a form of enjoyment, as entertainment, and how it's related to just the, the limitless capacities of the video game uh, environment and the limitless, the increasingly limitless capacities of media production in, in so many of forms. And we're here at the talent, uh, you know, the talent campus um, to understand how to make things, you know, how, how to empower. It is a very empowering uh, environment that we're in. Um, but it, it shouldn't just stop with, the, uh, with empowerment as an end in itself. We really have to ask ourselves, what is empowerment for? Because it could go in any number of directions. Do you want to comment on that, empowerment? Because I thought that I mean, was interesting. It, it, it's in one of our, our goals to kind of take this medium and to um, basically to show what you can also do with it, how, what, what, what other possibilities of storytelling there would be, um, and to show the, the, yeah, the scope of action that you're allowed to, to yeah. use, and that, that, of course. So we also, I mean, the, the gaming community is, is a very interesting target group for us as well, because of course, uh, um, that's, that's what I think you should really see as a, as a potential. Um, so yeah, of course, we, we, we try to, to make something of this. We try to also recycle uh, what, 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 what the software offers us um, and to make something else of it, I think. So in, in some sense, uh, many people also do it. If you look at the gamer, gamers community, of course, there's a lot of interest there as well, what you can do. And there's so many machinimas and people actually using them and this for similar than we do it. Um, so yeah, but but still, I mean, it's such a young medium still. So mm. people are just learning how to use it and what to what to do with it. Actually, um, mm. you reminded me though of this really fascinating work um, by a, a feminist a video game critic and artist named Angela Washko. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her. Back in 2014, she was really interested in issues of gender within video game environments, uh, specifically World of Warcraft, and so. She went inside World of Warcraft um, and as, a, as an avatar, going to the environments, and every, anytime she saw a player dressed as a female, she would go up to them and start a chat. So, excuse me, my name is Angela, and I'm um, just curious, why did you, are, you, are, you male or, are you a male or female player? Like, and they were almost always male. <laughs> so why do you choose to uh, play a female avatar? And there, there was, you know, a, very, a wide variety too. Not just like the, uh, you know, the quintessential uh, hypersexed female avatar, but like a panda wearing a bikini. Like someone was <laughs> chose this as their avatar. So really strange expressions of gender. Um, yeah, and, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a documentary being filmed inside a video game, and that just blew my mind. As like, wow, you didn't know you can do that. And now, and now you, you know, what we're seeing with you as well is just. Uh, how, and, and so I guess my question is, um, yeah, how, how did you start to turn this into a documentary practice? And also what makes you um, choose to submit it to a film festival as opposed to, because you do many, many different forms of, you've, you've done live uh, performative, um, you know, um, interventions with the video game environment. So, but I guess specifically, mm -hmm. what about documentary and cinema? Okay, uh, so uh, to be, I, I will be, will be honest with, with you because we're, um, um, it started with our first video that Leonhard and me did. It's called Operation Jane Walk, and it's an architecture tour through an online shooter game. Um, and it started, as, as you said, we started to do this as a performance. We are more into visual arts. Um, and it, so the idea was to basically show, use this huge playground and to talk about architecture and about urbanism and about city history and stuff like this. 
So it's like a tour of one and a half hours, um, taking people through. And then we decided that it would be nice to have like a short version of it. We cut it, uh, edited it, and we made like a short movie. And then we had this idea, well, not why not submit, submit it to some film festival, let's see. And we submitted it, of course, as an experimental movie, because we thought this is an experimental movie, of course. Um, and then they actually uh, t told us that they would actually prefer to put us into the documentary section. And then we were like, yeah, maybe actually it's a documentary that we did. We didn't really think about it, to be very honest about this very much. Um, and, and yeah, since then we are documentary filmmakers. <laughs> 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 and then it started, and um, since this first film was such a, such a product of a coincidence somehow, uh, we had this, um, this urge now to really work on the movie and to really write it and script it um, more, more carefully and more thoroughly yeah. somehow. Yeah, I, I call this cross-media. I'm a professor at Merz Academy. We have a, a department called cross-media publishing. I have some students from cross-media, and this is, this is exactly why cross-media is, is cool. <laughs> You're doing it, yeah. Before we go to the next clip, I would actually be curious to hear from the audience what went through your head, what did you observe when we watched those excerpts. We have this amazing microphone. I have to steal it one day. Because and, and by the way, we also yeah. have uh, 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 Franz Josef here in the audience. He's one of the avatars or, or uh, protagonists. Actors. Uh, actors. Please, Franz Josef, stand, stand up. <laughs> 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 You seen the you seen the plane in the first uh, in this uh, big shot. He was that, flying the plane. That was him. <laughs> yeah, that was him. Okay. Uh, and then we have our composer as well uh, in the first row, Adina Kami. Um, <laughs> so if you have any more questions, you can also uh, uh, ask them. And I saw on social media that you did a concert last night. Wow. Yeah, I saw it With too late. With our score. You played the soundtrack and. Remix of the soundtrack. Okay, so you missed that just as we did, but it was through social media that I actually found out we're going to get to the virtual space. But maybe who wants to catch the microphone and share their observations? Uh, yeah. Just keep on talking because then they can switch the volume up. <laughs> the microphone is leaving the system. <laughs> Control out delete. Oh, it is leaving the system. Yeah, really? It is. Reboot. <laughs> it's a reboot. Just, I always want to say that the program I'm in in, in uh, True False is called Control Alt Shift. Maybe you can use mine. So it's like keystrokes are the new uh, programming language, I guess. Cool, thank <laughs> you. The talents people were what uh, you can ask the people from talents what the inspiration okay. for this. Okay. Oh, okay, it's working. Great. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I we can't throw it anymore. Yeah, this one, I don't think we can throw this one. <laughs> So I think that the video game format is particularly interesting to me um, as someone who grew up not being allowed to play video games and doesn't really have a relationship with them now. Um, I find it compelling in that it's like a fairly obvious and straightforward um, example of the fact that all media platforms sort of implicitly organize um, the possibilities for expression within those platforms, whether it's like a video game with specific rules where you'll get shot if you run off, or like a desktop that kind of has this like metaphorical language of work and of the office loaded into it, or whether it's like Instagram, or I think like all the platforms that we're engaging with are sort of similarly shaping the possibilities for our action and for our expression, albeit in less obvious ways. So it seems to me that video games are um, a really like beautiful way of dramatizing that in one of its most um, evident forms. So that was really interesting. Well, that was impressive. <laughs> no, um, I think I really liked it. Um, I, I see like in academia and documentary, there's a tendency of going for like this 
war uh, video games that you know are kind of like a caricature in politics. But I do think there are certain mm, games that are really political. For example, Death Stranding or the video games by Hideo Kojima. Uh, I mean, he's talking about he he was he went on to say the the, the game was about Brexit. Although I don't know if it is, but um, I mean, I think that there are also many games being made more in the experimental side that also. I don't know if you've had any experience with those more. I mean, they're they're not. I mean, the independent ones, but they're, they're also big ones that have, I don't know tell stories and use these new ways of expression. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and of course there's also. I mean, Kojima is probably an edge case in the mainstream genre, but there is a growing segment of indie games which which deals with innovative storytelling and so on. But I mean, at some point when we were working on our projects, we went through. Like Steam li or game libraries, basically uh, uh, trying to get a feel for like the market share of of, of war or military themed games within the mainstream sector, and it is around like 80 percent ish. That like 80 percent of all mainstream games deal with this kind of like military. Yeah, I, I mentioned Kojima because he's also military kind of. So. Yeah, yeah. You mean the, uh, the Death Stranding? The well, last. I mean, they all they all have like this machines and guns and stuff, you know. Yeah. But I think you actually you don't fight in Kojima's uh, latest game at all, yeah, even though exactly. yeah. You can, but yeah. Who wants it? Yeah, I actually um, I actually had a question about uh, the ISIS uh, desktop documentary. Um, it, you know, uh, I guess the question is, obviously, this kind of information we need to talk about it and you know make sure that. Uh, it's talked about so history doesn't repeat itself in a way, but how do you also prevent it from, uh, how, do you, how do you control like, the, like, this, you know, making it discoverable the, for... The replicating of effects. Or exactly, things like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. So. That, is, that is the question. That is yeah. definitely the question. <laughs> uh, and this is why we're having these closed-door workshops and uh, just to kind of come up with new ways of, of framing the, the thing. Um, I mean, this is something that researchers are, are, are really trying to do as well. Um, I'm working closely with a, um, a propaganda research group in Mainz, in Mainz, Germany, um, who've done incredible work. They have one of the largest archives of ISIS propaganda uh, in the world. And so what does it mean that, you know, there's a database somewhere in Germany that has all of these videos? It, it's uh, really raising these questions of responsibility and, and uh, how do we contain this sort of archive in the making, now that it's, um, it's, it's historical material as well. And, and also, how do, we, yeah, how do we manage ourselves in relation to it? Because one of these researchers, uh, his job was to um, catalog every single uh, ISIS video that they received. And uh, he, he was like, OK, how do I watch all these? Do I have to watch all these? And I have to like, make notes on every single one? And his, he decided, you know, I'm just going to just go for it. He, he uh, went through like a binge watching session. Uh, he watched like a thousand ISIS videos in one month and uh, just, just writing notes, sort of, sort of this kind of distracted um, viewing technique that I did with you know, taking the notes as, as I'm watching it so I'm not totally paying attention as a way to kind of have a, a distance. Um, but he still contracted symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, after, after going through this, uh, this research phase. And so, um, yeah, this video, the, this material that um, in many ways should not be watched, but it does exist. There was a film last year in the forum uh, by Nicholas Gerhalter called Erde, uh, which is a fantastic film. And the, the last part of it, it's, it's about human beings' relationship to the earth, to, to, to soil. And the last part is this shaft, like many miles uh, underneath the ground, I think in, Aust in the Austrian Alps, where they are storing nuclear waste material. And it's just like, this is where it goes. And they're, they're just hoping that, you know, that's safe enough to kind of, you know, so this human generated um, toxic material, you know, it exists in the world and it, it, it's basically not going away. So where do we put it? Uh, this, but, but we should not forget that it exists. That's the thing. So it's like having this distance, but also finding a way to manage it. There are two things I would like to comment to that. One thing is, um, I'm curious about this archive. Who is archiving it and for what purpose? Because there are people, um, very few, but maybe just even one person, who watches all these videos from all over the world to analyze the weapons. 
and he is so good at understanding what kind of weapon are they using in this moment and in that moment that he can actually help to track illegal weapon um, exporting and importing and the trade routes of legal and illegal um, uh, weapon trading. So he has a completely different reason for watching, mm -hmm. also from the Ukraine and from I don't know where. So I'm curious about why is this archive collecting and what is it collecting for? And I must add, I don't know anything about the gaming world and I don't know anything about the ISIS videos. So I haven't seen any of these. So I must ask you with the, um, I thought it was mainly recruiting heroic depictions of war in deserts. But it is also all the decapitization. It's all also these. That's sort actually of a brutal. very, very small percentage, to be honest. And that, that's that's another important thing is to actually uh, debunk these myths and stereotypes about what ISIS is, because that's that's also what contributes to the aura of terror. Is you just imagine the worst things possible. But uh, they have ISIS NGO videos that resemble things that you see, like produced by United Nations, by UNESCO. It's like you know supporting the children, and it's just fascinating how they use the visual language of like nonprofit education educational videos by like UNICEF or UNESCO, but you know, with ISIS characteristics. <laughs> so to me, that just kind of makes you aware of, of the language of cinema, uh, that, that anyone can use the tools and the rhetoric mm -hmm. to, to see the rhetorical um, spectrum of, of media. And then that makes you think, okay, it could be used for this, it could be used for that. But just to see that it doesn't belong to anyone in particular. So, so, so just out of curiosity, so you, did, you, did you feel then that as films they work kind of similarly structurally as, as the stuff that, you, that we are used to viewing or, or, or did you sometimes yeah. have the feeling you're watching something that's completely odd and, to you? And yes, uh, it, it, yes, both. Uh, it's, uh, you know, strange, strange defamiliarization effects and sometimes even a form of criticism. So this, this example of the uh, ISIS UNICEF video where it's, you know, you imagine those uh, you know, UNICEF or um, uh, NGO videos that look at, you know, poor people, poor children in the Middle East or Africa who are like the victims of war or famine, and you have these like very sympathetic shots, and it's like, okay, we must, we the West, we Europe must give resources to help them. But this time, you have those same shots of helpless um, young children in like Syria, but this time you hear like, this is what the West did to us. Um, and, and at the same time, they then say that we need their help, but we're not going to fall for those lies anymore. And then one of these poor children, victims of war, at the end of the video, put, takes up a gun. And so it's like, it's like hijacking that rhetoric of, of uh, third world helplessness into something that's like, oh my God. So, so and, and this, it becomes a form of critique. And uh, I think what's, what's very frightening is, yeah, just, um, this, the odd way that it kind of resonates to someone who has sympathies for, um, yeah, for, for cl against colonialism, against the effects of uh, colonialism against uh, most parts of the world. It's very interesting um, to, to take it somehow back to the world of video games again, or for what we have um, uh, dealt with is, I mean, of course, this bat Battlefield video game, is, it's, not, it's not a recruiting game the American Arm, American Army is a recruiting game, but Battlefield is not. It's uh, it, it's it's a game, and it's basically a commercial product. It wants to be there. It's about revenue, and it's it's a huge investment. It it costed millions of dollars, and so it should be sold, and it should work, and it should entertain. That's its its main uh, thing. And of course, they use kind of established ways of 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 narration or of gameplay because they know it will work. Then that's how it basically works with convention and as a as a product of, of capitalism, basically. So, um, um, but still it's kind of, it follows this specific kind of logics and what we really tried was to kind of uh, also to, not to reproduce this, the, the logics, also the visual logics so much. So we were really searching for places of peace or places of, uh, uh, or ways how to contradict kind of what is going on in this video game and what actually things you can, you can find in these spaces that are not immediately referring again to this uh, combat logic thing. So we were, yeah, this was like one of the big challenges to, to, to find something and to do something there which is not again kind of playing war. And that's what I was just thinking when you explained the, the UNICEF ISIS uh, 
yeah, um, that there is no reason to reinvent a new aesthetic or a different kind of storytelling. But in your case, you need to mm -hmm. use a different kind of aesthetic to reveal something. <laughs> but of course, in that case, nothing needs to be revealed. It needs to... Yeah. Not, not reveal, steal. steal. <laughs> we steal. Yeah. Um, and we are parasites, actually. Yeah. But what do you steal? We, we steal the material and uh, do something else with it. Or uh, hijack. Or hijack it, <laughs> yeah. Um, and we, we use this, uh, these millions of dollar uh, um, stage design in order to tell our stories on top of it. And I'm very grateful of the comment, of the first comment, because uh, you were referring on something very important, uh, what video games are, um, are right now, or even more, we become more and more social spaces. They are just not computer games, they are social spaces. I mean, the next generation um, um, actually um, is like having their social spaces within Fortnite. Like, Every time when they have a break within, like be between the, the, the within the school, um, they talk about this. And when some of the parents are restricting Fortnite, then you're kind of locked out of their social social space, and then you, you're kind of like frozen. You you can't participate anymore. And this like this feature of computer game, I think if they want to get completely consume everything, they, they will also become social media on some point. They're, when we are like um, pensioners, um, then, <laughs> then, then we will meet each other in computer games, and the computer games not just we provide some games, I, I, I can imagine, but they also we provide like free space to stroll about and to do something else together. Like uh, Michael, he, he was uh, w with one of the other actors um, who, who, is in, who is in Russia right now. They, they met each other uh, after work um, almost every day in GTA 5. And then they were uh, like doing something what friends are doing with each other. But he was in Siberia and Michael was in, uh, in, 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 in Oberösterreich. And, and, and they were like hiking around or, or, or driving cars and, and talking about uh, what, what was happening in the work and so on. Maybe, maybe yeah. is this true what I'm <laughs> telling? <laughs> sure Before we go to the next two clips, I also add an anecdote of friends of mine. Their daughter is new in a school. I think she's 12 years old and um, is having trouble to fit in, but everybody in that school knows that she's the best player of a certain game that I don't know, even the parents. It's like, oh, she is the one who does, yeah? <laughs> so <laughs> she's really big in that game, and, yeah. uh, and the other story they told me, and then that's how she finds access. So mm -hmm. her best friend in that game, they actually met, I don't know, six weeks later after she entered that school, but knew each other already through the game. And then the other story they told me was that Boys usually get PlayStations for Christmas, girls don't. So the boys meet in PlayStations and girls meet on mobile phone app mm -hmm. games mm -hmm. because they just don't get given those PlayStations and don't have access. So this boy, there is this one boy who's really popular with the girls because he's one of the very few boys who plays mobile phone games <laughs> and not PlayStation. Dating so, tips. Dating tips, exactly. <laughs> I think Fortnite covers both. That's why it's so successful. Probably, But yeah, you can play it on many it. platforms. Yeah. One comment from here, and then we do the next two clips, please. Yeah, there it is. Look, there it is. I we found it. I had a question. Ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I didn't realize. Oh, okay. Um, so I just want to say that um, the material that we discussed today was very relevant to my personal experience because I was a sergeant in the 8th Army Public Affairs. And I had to make a, quite a bit of propaganda myself for the US and Korean army. And um, I think that as part of our regulations as soldiers, what we're told to do is to keep um, political neutrality and we can't overtly show our support for a specific party. We could only vote for them. And I think this kind of relates to the apolitics within video games. And 
um, uh, for me, I think to combat you know this kind of um, submission of video games as um, from growing into its true potential is largely because it's a male-dominated homogenous society um, with these cis, cis white males who have these um, mostly right-wing views. And I think to combat this misogyny is that we have to upend this traditional beliefs that girls have mobile phones, boys have playstations. And for me- We have to, sorry, I didn't hear the last. Oh, um, we I have to get, you say it's a belief that it, they use different games? No, I think that it's something that um, socially that we need to combat um, these traditional perceptions yeah. that create a divide between um, males and females and their approach and their access to these sorts of media. Yeah, and in this case it's Christmas yeah. that <laughs> makes a difference. <laughs> there was a... Unless you want to comment back. No, we're fine. Um, just a comment on um, how the potential of making a documentary film within the video game and, and portraying the people behind it through video game. Um, in Sweden, where I come from, there's a big discussion about the whole generation of young, young boys like living their life and not like meeting girls or getting a job or getting education and getting behind because of partly blame on the video games. Um, and. Um, I was just thinking of a scene in Joachim uh, Trier's film, Louder Than Bombs, where the mom passed, passed away and uh, the son in the family locks himself in the room and uh, plays a lot of, I don't know if it's World of Warcraft, and uh, Gabriel Bur Byrne, who plays the father, uh, is creating an um, avatar in the game to try to connect with his son, and he searches for him for hours in the game and finds him. And, there's this really like touching scene where they stand next to each other and he says, the father says, hello. And then the son just kills him. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like, it was just like a touching way of like showing how they, they like live in the same house but parallel lives. So there's like a huge potential in like portraying this generation within these formats. Thank you. Is that a reaction to, yep. Yeah, Throw either th either catch or shout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or pass. <laughs> um, yeah, I just had a question about the desktop documentary because you started talking about ISIS using um, UNICEF style uh, images, and I wondered if you uh, discovered any kind of um, similarities to the way cults use propaganda material. Because when you go to the Church of Scientology, they have similar videos as well. Um, and I don't know if that, I mean, it is, I guess, a cult as well, but if, you, if there were similarities in the way that, the, that you found in the video in the ISIS uh, film. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in Scientology videos. Okay. I'm, I'm dealing with one <laughs> <laughs> case study at a time. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Peter. Hello, Hello. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to comment, I mean, if you go to the church, Christian churches, you find similar propaganda as well. It's they're just another form of cult. Um, just, um, and um, yeah, uh, I think you didn't use the expression, but I see your, your strategy quite as a strategy of disobedience, because you are uh, playing not to the rules of the gaming industry, you're playing a, dis a disobedient role, so you're misusing it, abusing it, but you still have to stick within the system of the, of the limitations of the game, which is a bit different to uh, Kevin's strategies, which allows him more freedom on his desktop. Um, and then I have a question which um, I discussed with Kevin already, but I don't know how it is with the gaming industry, which is about copyrights. I think it was um, <laughs> mentioned uh, before. Um, and as you are just putting another layer by using um, the aesthetics of the games, um, would you think that you get along with the, uh, with the law of the art uh, form, or would you, did you ever hear about any kind of copyright infringement situation that they, that they prosecute uh, the gaming industry? Or did you ever get in touch with one of these people? 
So um, we're getting asked this question often because people, of course, wonder. Um, and the, the situation is that um, basically making videos is like a, a super important secondary video, uh, secondary media for video games. So they actually uh, make tools like Battlefield here. It has something like a movie mode inside, which we used also for for making these shots. Basically, to allow people to make, to use, to to record it as well, to make videos. It has all these functions of a camera inside. Um, so, of course, they are, they they get the games. They depend on um, people sharing it and ventilating their contents. Um, in fact. Uh, of course, many people do exactly that, making movies in uh, in video games and get loads of money from it, like all these Let's Players or also all the Machinima scene. And, um, but it's really, really difficult, nearly impossible to get official rights to do something in a video game. So basically this is all kind of precarious because everybody uses it and no one is really allowed to do it. And the experience is that they are actually happy that people use it and ventilate it. Um, as long as they don't fear that this would uh, cut the revenue exactly. in some sense. So as long as it doesn't kind of, uh, they, they don't fear that uh, through that they will face some losses or someone will decide not to buy the game because you saw something. Uh, as long as this is not the case, they will not probably sue anyone doing it. But they could, and there are some cases where they actually were some, for instance, Let's Players, like people that play video games for other people to watch, uh, were um, were sued, um, basically because they were very negative in their review. So that's kind of the cases where they decided to do this, but uh, I, I don't know any other cases. Yeah, with regard to desktop documentary, it's a very uh, interesting thing to think about. I'm, I'm actually teaching a class at my school next semester called Screen Stories, where I'm gonna have my students try to come up with uh, short films that take place on desktops or on social media on their phones. And so then the question of, you know, if you have a film that takes place on Facebook or on Instagram or on Tinder, yeah, are there copyright issues involved there? Or are, are, you, are you in a similarly precarious situation? And I, I don't know the answer to this, <laughs> but there's only, you know, the only way out is through. Like we have to, we, we can't just sort of censor ourselves uh, for fear of any potential uh, repercussions. I think as, as artists especially, our job is to find out what happens, uh, to, to not be afraid to experiment and just try and see what happens. And, and when the, if the backlash or some repercussions do happen, to find a way to channel it to raise a larger awareness of how, how we are being governed. Mm -hmm. Disobedience is a good stichwort. Chris, can we auch springen by the videos? Yeah? Welches is then dann ganz good for this disobedience um, stichwort? Refusing or real wars? A refusing, I think, is. Sounds Probably. like it, yeah. huh? disobedience and refusing. <laughs> Können wir dann das letzte Video, das hat die Nummer 59165 um, unterstrich refusing am Schluss einspielen. Yeah, so for those who don't play computer games like me, you have to explain <laughs> who is who and... So, uh, yeah, so basically... Uh, the four avatars uh, crawling on the ground in the gray uniform, that's, that's, those are played by us. And you? Uh, Franz, Franz, for example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I guess I have to provide some context. Uh, this particular game, Battlefield, uh, doesn't allow you to, to film in an isolated space, so you cannot open up your own game and, and, and just film in peace. Rather, you're forced to, to film in a running game session. So you're always... Um, in the middle of combat, basically, and, and we, we, we were trying to do all our scenes, or kind of find space for our scenes in, in you know, battle, uh, in the middle of battle. And, and to some extent, of course, that's also welcome, though, because it provides us with a chance to actually intervene in the combat that is going on and try to, to um, sort of distract players from, from fighting, and that's what's going on here. So the players, the sniper in the first so shot, and this kind of like officer standing with this pistol in the second shot, those are players that we don't know, uh, other players which we kind of just, in the, in the second case of that officer, annoyed so long that they left the game in the end, so, <laughs> yeah. But we were thinking a lot about, uh, about how, how pacifism could work in a the, in the game like that. We had many plans and tried some things also. Uh, one of the idea was actually to read stories of existing 
uh, deserters from various wars, like uh, um, um, diaries. diaries and so on, uh, and to basically confront people. Um, like uh, there's this nice uh, German word, uh, Zwangsbeglückung, um, like forcing them for, for, to hear this, these stories. Um, but then we kind of, it, for technical reasons, that's actually not possible. So we tried many things, how to, how to bring peace into these worlds, but the chat and so on. But this is, this is all not really working. So that's kind of the best thing uh, or the best experiments that, <laughs> that we came of up with. being so, really annoying. Basically annoy the players of your own team. Because this is, I mean, maybe this you didn't get, but this is actually, he's from our own team. He's like playing with us. Otherwise, the Nazi. The Nazi. Like you can yeah. choose whether you're a Nazi or an American soldier. Yeah, you cannot choose. Can you the, choose. The game decides for you on which ah, sides okay. you fight. But yeah, yeah. Um, that's why he, he, he shoots at us, but we don't get hurt because he's from our side. So it, he, we, he cannot harm us. He's just ir he's totally irritated. And what's also very funny here is that actually it's, it's like four of us. But it's two other players that just decided to join us in this funny action. <laughs> so they. <laughs> That's why I was confused and yeah. asked yeah, yeah, yeah. who because. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that you, also happened a few times. The the players that are kind of popping in, they are basically spawning on their teammates, which would be us. They just don't they, they don't know that we're quite useless teammates, and, and so they, <laughs> they decide to spawn on us, and they just kind of spontaneously joined in. They saw four people like crawling around with hammers on the ground, and. Yeah. <laughs> So they were, of course, we were following the chats uh, and so on in the in-game chat, and sometimes they were like, oh, what these assholes are doing, they're destroying the game. Sometimes they were like, whoa, what these funny guys are doing there, <laughs> I'm going to join them. <laughs> yeah. Sure, where's the... This portal cube. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm, I was a professional Battlefield player in Battlefield 3 and 4 in Hotline. So the first uh, clip I saw of the video game was quite interesting and I thank you guys for doing that because a lot of people that play the game don't think about stuff like this. Um, what I find interesting about the second clip is that it's actually a thing um, to, if you stop uh, playing the game and kind of pause like you did, people actually join and it's quite often that that ha happens and the most interesting thing is that it actually happens with the opponent team as well. With what? With the opponent team that opponent. happens as well so if an opponent, opponent sees you doing that then he most often stops doing and pauses and does the same thing with you and there's also something um, which is another game, which is Counter-Strike, there's something called uh, Stats Roulette. I don't know if you're aware of that. Stats Roulette? No. It's basically... Uh, chat Roulette. Stats, stats, like... St okay, statistics. Yeah, yeah. Statistics yeah. Roulette, okay. Yeah, and it's basically something where you um, join a game five on five and you play the opponents with your team and then uh, you have a, a, a different website where you go and you get um, strats that you have to follow, like uh, throw the bomb at one bomb spot and then go around in ducking and shoot with pistols only and stuff like that, or don't shoot every, uh, someone or stay in a spawn or something. So I think it's really interesting that you wrap that because it's uh, something that is living in the game already in a part, in a sense. So thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, uh, disobedience was uh, one of our key terms because um, um, disobedience is not just what we are doing, what our set of tool is. Uh, um, it's, it's maybe um, the core of creativity uh, from within the community. Like when, when you're disobedient, disobedient within uh, the rules uh, of a game, then you're creative per se. So uh, a lot of players, uh, they, they have uh, great fun with being um, disobedient towards the media and then they upload it and then they inspire others to do so as well. So this is, this is where we are learning a lot from the community and where we also attempt to kind of create with total refusal our collective a kind of a laboratory in order to develop tools to give something back to the community as well. Because it's, uh, 
it, it makes fun to be disobedient. We, we all know this from our childhood, um, <laughs> and we all know how, how, how creative and uh, childishness can be. Foremost, when the games are taking themselves so serious. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add to what you said, that there's this beautiful um, um, moment where that sometimes uh, when a server is too empty to actually start a game, then you, are, you can already like, be there, but the game didn't start yet because you're waiting for other players to join. And that's also one of these kind of uh, spaces where you can even like, meet the people from the other team sometimes. Sometimes you don't shoot because it doesn't count. You yeah. don't get any points for it. It's basically useless to kill someone. So in these kind of moments, there's like the most beautiful things armistice. can happen. Mm. It's an armistice kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we also had the idea to include it, but it's so complicated to explain this in the video that we then decided not to use it, but it's a very interesting space. So either we take disobedience as the Schlusswort, as the closing remark, which I think is a very beautiful closing remark, unless there are questions, desires to continue, comments, yeah. yeah. Hey, um, so one question for Kevin. I would be curious, have you ever tried to get in contact with people behind the ISIS videos, like the video creators about the network behind who's doing them? Say that again? Uh, did sorry. you ever get in touch with anybody who did right. those, who made those ISIS videos? Right, that is kind of the next phase of the project. Um, but at, at this point, I'm kind of uh, in, in this phase of kind of imagining kind of playing with the power of imagination, I think that's a, a very important dimension to the, this, this question of media terror is the thing that we imagine. So I'm, I'm right now I'm kind of building a sketch of what I imagine this uh, person on the other side of the screen to be. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm in also in the process of looking to find where I could uh, contact uh, a, a, such a media producer, yeah. Would it be possible to show? The, are we going to show the? Yes, we can videos? also show okay. the last. I, I, well, I just want to mention the Faroki clip because, uh, yeah, because uh, I've I've also been making a series of video essays produced by the Goethe Institute um, about Harun Faroki since I, I name dropped him earlier, and I wanted to include this particular clip related to the question of how to disappear because, yeah, I, one thing I want to say about this last clip was like media as a form of activism, and how this virtual space allows us to imagine our bodies in real, what our bodies can do in a real space. Uh, what would be the, the real space equivalent of crawling on the ground and interfering with, with other people? Um, and this was something I, I analyzed in Harun Faroqi's films. Uh, of the 120 films and videos that he made, uh, he appears in, in many of them uh, himself. And I was curious about how he uses himself as an instrument or as a model of activism. Um, and so I wanted to show this clip that shows him at the beginning of his career back in the 1960s as a radical media activist. And then at the end of his career, when he doesn't show up in any of his films at all. Uh, and why, why does he disappear from, um, from his own films? Uh, and I, I think it does connect to your work. Then that clip is our closing remark then. And I think that's even more beautiful yeah. to um, do it with Harun Faroki. It's a clip 59020. Faroki presented Kevin. Harun Faroki appears in 24 of his own films. His time on screen totals 2 hours and 21 minutes, enough to form a movie in itself. Was kann das Ziel dieser Anschauung sein? Muss die Anschauung ein Ziel haben? He first appears in a short that he directed in film school, an agitprop against the commercial newspaper industry. Unsere Zeitungen bringen Nachrichten aus dem kämpfenden Kollektiv. Der Unterschied zwischen Lesenden und Schreibenden muss aufgehoben werden. He appears as something like an action hero from a spy thriller. But it isn't so much to mimic a Hollywood image as to repurpose it against the mainstream media. Das kämpfende Kollektiv schafft eine neue Sprache. Das kämpfende Kollektiv gibt dem Privatverkehr einen völlig neuen Sinn. 
His image functions as a model for practicing alternative methods of communication. Das kämpfende Kollektiv lässt eine Nachricht zur Waffe aufsteigen. These early films ask, how can one's appearance be used in new ways to disrupt the complacency of the status quo? Wenn wir ihnen einen Menschen mit Napalmverletzungen zeigen, werden wir ihre Gefühle verletzen. Wenn wir ihre Gefühle verletzen, dann kommt es ihnen vor, als würden wir Napalm an ihnen und auf ihre Kosten vor. Wir können ihnen nur eine schwache Vorstellung davon geben, wie Napalm wirkt. Eine Zigarette verbrennt mit etwa 400 Grad. Napalm verbrennt mit etwa 3000 Grad Hitze. How can progressive ideas find proper expression in a body? For the last 17 years of his career, he no longer appears on screen. Has he exhausted the creative possibilities of his bodily presence? Or is appearing on screen no longer necessary or relevant to his final investigations? Scanning machine. Um, this These works explore such topics as surveillance systems, computer simulation, and virtual reality, and operational images for machine learning and automation. An emerging world of images to regulate human bodies, or else transcend them altogether. This new world of images demands to be inhabited by a new set of ideas and actions. What will all this newness leave behind? Will this world require us to inhabit it beyond the capacity of our bodies, beyond even the capacity of images as we have known them, and all the images we have known? Ein Bild hat sich erhalten. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah, this, so this question of how do we come back to our bodies, how do we come back to physical spaces, and it is a very Farrokhian thing, because I think it was in 1982, his feature film, uh, uh, Before Your Eyes Vietnam, was rejected from the Berlinale Forum. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what he did, what he is... <laughs> did, he staged an intervention at the Delphi Cinema, where he did a live version of the movie in the lobby without permission, and, and it was a, as a form of protest. So he, he had a live version of the film as a way for the film to be seen, and then as a, re as a result, the film did get invited to, the, it did get added to the, uh, the program. So just as a way of thinking about interventions and, and what you can and cannot do, just, uh, it's, it's a really inspiring example. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not I'm, suggesting. Wait, wait, wait. I don't I'm, know looking, about you. I'm very much looking forward to all the interventions you have. I think four <laughs> days left, but only people who got refused by the Berlinale are allowed to do interventions. <laughs> I wish you a wonderful evening, uh, afternoon, rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.